for uh, joining. Thanks, Heather. And uh, thanks for joining the class with Kenmore Camera and, um, and OM System slash Olympus. And uh, my name is Mike, and I'll, I'll present this for you guys. So we're going to talk about macro today and uh, sort of the beginning, the journey of macro, right? Uh, just some insight, some tips, uh, things of that nature. So hopefully you enjoy the presentation. And like we said, I'll do my best to answer questions at the end. So put them in the Q&A. And we'll go through them at the end and uh, try to keep them, you know, focused on the subject. And I'll, I'll do my best, like I said, to answer. If I can't answer, um, definitely there's a lot of things out there, a lot of uh, information on our website and also our YouTube uh, and more coming. So I'm going to stop my video here so you don't have to stare at my face and, um, and share this here for you guys. So, all right, give me a second here. Let's see. Doop. And... All right, you should be able to see my screen there. Can you see that, um, Heather? Is my presentation showing up okay? There we go. Sorry, I had I was muted. Um, yes, it looks perfect. Beautiful. All right, just wanted to make sure it was there. Thank All you. right, guys. So we're going to talk about beginning the journey. We're going to talk about some gear, some tips, and some settings uh, using the OM system in Olympus. And again, this can be translated to other brands as well. Um, mostly, it's it's macro uh, in general. Um, and let's go. So my name is Mike Amico. I've uh, been in the industry about 22 years. Not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because I have a lot of slides to go through. But if you've done my classes before, thanks for coming back. And if you haven't, well, welcome. And uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a master trainer and a key account manager for uh, OMDS or OM Digital Solutions representing OM System slash Olympus, right? And uh, what I love about these cameras, you know, I came to Olympus in 2015. And uh, you know, I was, I was with another company uh, when Four Thirds was introduced and, um, you know, I always loved the size and, and all that stuff. And I always was a mirrorless guy. Um, but coming back around that time was when the uh, EM5-2 was out and the EM-1-2 came out. And that's where your computational really started to take place and take form and, and shape and things got faster and, and more accurate. And the viewfinders got better with mirrorless. And I really became a big fan of the size of the cameras and the, the features. And they were just a lot of fun. And so from then on, I've always had a camera on me. I mean, I always carried my cameras, but I wouldn't pull them out of the car or what have you. Now there's always a camera on me. So I'm still having a ton of fun. The new OM1 has been really fun. I'm, it's brought even more fun back to it for me. So constantly out there. And like I was mentioning before, if you were on um, me for macro, I'm, I'm more a birder. I, I like birding and, uh, and, and some landscape and things of that nature. Macro for me is more close up. I do more, um, a lot of car shows, a lot of car emblems. I like old cars, like rusty cars. Um, I like shooting the engines with close up wide angle, uh, things of that nature. But I also like telemacro using the uh, telephoto lenses and out there shooting, you know, nature or wildlife and then seeing a, a grasshopper, um, you know, on a, on a branch and being able to photograph that while I'm there. So I enjoy that type of shooting, um, at least for now. I want to play a little more this year with stacking and things of that nature. Um, but it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of opportunity, especially with four thirds getting close up stuff. So, so let's talk about it. Here's what we're going to do today. So we'll talk a little bit about Macro by definition, what is macro? Uh, we'll do some gear selection, some recommendations. Um, I'll give you guys 15 macro tips. And then we'll go through some settings to get you started on your journey. And we'll talk a little bit about the tough camera. Um, at that point, we might be close to time. So I may blow through that a little bit, but a lot of the feature sets we'll have already talked about. So, but that camera is a macro gem, I call it. It's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, a lot of the images in this presentation, this one is mine. That's kind of some of the things I do. Um, but some of the images you'll see, um, I've used from uh, a former coworker, a friend of mine, Yannick, um, from Canada, some great stuff with uh, close up like bugs and things like that. So like we were talking about Heather. So I wanted to uh, share some of that as well. All right. So what is macro photography? And really it's extreme close up photography, right? And, uh, you know, it's about photographing objects that are very close to the lens or the sensor. And, uh, the classic definition uh, is the image shown on the sensor is nearly as big as the object photographed. So the ratio of the subject size on the sensor plane to the actual subject size is known as the reproduction ratio. So likewise, a macro lens is classically a lens or typically you know, capable of reproduction ratios of at least one to one uh, life size, although it often refers to any lens with a large reproduction ratio. And I want to remind everybody to print big. I do this on most of my presentations. 
Um, a lot of times we like to get likes and share and, you know, get our stuff out there on social media these days, but a lot of times we forget about printing and, um, you know, th there's just amazing things you can do now. Printing is a different industry now, and, and you can print on almost anything. And, you know, stores like Kenmore can print and, uh, and really get some great stuff out there for you. And it's, there's nothing like holding a final of your image. So make sure you do that. And don't be afraid to print big. Um, the shot that I showed there was with the EM1 Mark II. Uh, this is an old uh, image from uh, Home Shopping Network. And the picture that she's showing right there is a 24 by 36 that was taken with one of our older waterproof cameras, um, like a TG6. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a really small sensor camera. So don't be afraid to print and print big. Uh, there's amazing stuff out there. So what are some advantages to the OM system in Olympus uh, overall? Well, one is going to be the compactness and, and how powerful they are being so small. Um, this is a, a real world shot of Kevin Laughlin from Wildside Nature Tours uh, standing next to another gentleman. And Kevin actually has two cameras. He's got one on his side as well, an EM-12 with a 40 to 152 8 Pro and a 1.4 converter. And here he has the 300 millimeter F4 Pro with the EM-1X. And... Um, you know, the other gentleman has a, a camera that has a, a focal length that's equivalent with ours. Ours is equivalent to what they're seeing about the same. Um, but the difference is that Kevin can focus within four feet with that telemacro on that lens. So if a bird lands behind one of these guys or a butterfly or what have you, he can spin around and shoot it where the other gentleman has to be 15 feet away. So it's one of the advantages of four thirds and mirrorless uh, being able to get closer with a lot of your lenses. The weather resistance, um, it's just renowned weather resistance with the cameras. Uh, this was a shot of me from Daytona when the EM1X came out. It started pouring. So a coworker of mine and I myself decided we would stay out there for 40 minutes in the cold rain in Daytona and shoot the cars anyway. Um, and so 40 to 152.8 EM1X. And um, this is what we do to the cameras. I mean, we just, we spray them to just give you that weather resistance where if you have the right lens and the right body mixed together, as long as you're not putting pressure on it underwater, you can rinse it off after a day at the beach. So it's, uh, it's really good weather resistance. And it's nice to be out there with things like macro or um, birding or what have you being out in nature and being adventurous and it rains and you don't have to put your gear away. There's nothing like that. I did get some images that day, by the way, there's one. And here's another, no thought of the cars coming and flying off the tracks, but you know, I guess when you're there, you want to get the shot. So we also have that supersonic wave filter, which is great for um, changing lenses and dusty environments and things of that nature, windy environments. You still want to take care of your camera, keep it down, protect it, but it works really, really well. It's been almost 20 years. It came out in 2003 on the first E1 DSLR. Um, you turn the camera on, shakes the sensor about 30,000 times, vibrates it, knocks the dust off. And actually, we, we've improved this uh, even more, like 10% more with the EM5 III a couple of years ago, where we now put a coating on the sensor so the dust just slips right off and doesn't have anywhere to stick. So it's a really good uh, feature in the cameras. And if you ever feel the camera shake a little bit when you turn it on or you hear something, that's the sensor shaking. And of course, the stabilization, the in-body stabilizer or the IBIS uh, in the cameras is second to none in the industry. And we're up to uh, eight stops of shutter uh, speed steps. And that's when you're using specific cameras and lenses. So for instance, uh, an EM1 Mark III uh, with the 12 to 100 will give you eight stops. So certain cameras and lenses, um, but I mean, you're like seven to eight stops on pretty much everything now. And it's amazing. And, you know, world's best. I mean, you have this in a lot of cameras now, and it's amazing having any st stabilization in any camera. I mean, it's the best, right? It just helps us so much as photographers. With Olympus being a little bit smaller with that sensor, that whole mechanism is smaller. They actually made it even smaller again with the EM5 Mark III a couple of years ago. And that allows it to move around that body a lot more uh, than a larger sensor body. So you're able to get that, that even better stabilization because it can move so much. You move one way, the sensor moves the other way and compensates um, for that. So pretty cool. So let's talk about some cameras when it comes to macro. And I always tell everybody that the best camera is the camera that inspires you to keep taking images. Uh, when you go to a camera store like Kenmore and you pick up a camera and you talk to somebody at the counter that's an expert, and you go through some of the camera lines and brands and the cameras, and you pick up some of the cameras, there's nothing like that because 
the camera that calls to you is the one you're going to take images with. And there's no perfect camera. Every camera has benefits and negatives and every system has benefits and negatives, but you weigh those out when you find the camera that you love. And that's the camera you're going to take with you. It's, it's, it's not about bragging. You know, it's not about any of that stuff. It's really about the photography and enjoying it. And I think that when you find a camera that you truly enjoy, you're going to have it with you all the time and you're going to shoot and your images are going to get better. So when it comes to the uh, OM system slash Olympus cameras, um, really every camera in my line uh, will do macro and is, and is great, um, including the TG6 tough camera, which we'll talk about. Uh, it really comes down to lens selection on all the other cameras, um, you know, which lenses you're using. Uh, and of course, as you go up in the line, you get into the weather resistance, you get into uh, more features like focus stacking and such uh, high resolution and all that stuff. But every camera in the lineup can do macro to some point. And of course, the lenses. So you have your macro lenses. And in my lineup, currently, I have two. So I have my um, my 30 millimeter. 3.5 macro and my 60 millimeter 2.8. The 60 millimeter 2.8 on the left, it's weather sealed uh, and it will give you the one-to-one -one capability. Uh, and the 30 millimeter on the right offers two and a half times magnification. Uh, both great lenses. Um, the 30 millimeter is nice and inexpensive and the 60 is not super expensive either. Um, it, it has, a, to me, a little more to offer with the weather resistance, uh, but it also has a focus limiter that does uh, confuse a lot of people. So we'll talk about that as well. So what type of macro lens works best for me? All right. So I went, I went too far, you guys. I apologize. Let me do that once. There we go. All right. So you have a minimum focusing distance when you're talking about macro lenses. And there's a minimum working distance as well. Um, so your working distance is basically how far you can, you can uh, work with that lens from the subject. So uh, from the lens to the subject on the 60 millimeter on the right, you have about four inches. On the uh, 30 millimeter, you can get a lot closer, uh, which is 0.55 inches. So it depends on how close or far away you want to get there. That's one. Your minimum focusing distance, uh, 3.7 inches on the 30 and 7.5 on the 60, that deals with um, from your sensor, right? So, or your film plane slash sensor. So if you look on your camera, all of the cameras, um, the digital cameras, uh, no matter which brand, you should see a little little icon on the, the viewfinder on top. Um, and if there's no viewfinder, it should be somewhere on the body, but it looks almost like a circle with a line through it usually. And that's basically telling you where the sensor is in the camera. It's where that sensor lies. And that's where you measure that minimum focusing distance from um, between that, that subject and the focal plane mark, which is exactly where the sensor is in the camera. So that's where those, those numbers come from. But it gives you an idea of where you're at, right? You want to know your limits when you're shooting macro because you want to know that you're able to focus or not. So let's look at this uh, 60 macro 2.8. This is the most confusing part of this lens. And I've talked to people uh, that absolutely hated the lens because of this. And once they understood the, the, the focus limiter, um, they absolutely love the lens. And it's a great lens because it also becomes a great portrait lens as well, being a 2.8 and the 60, which you know gives you an equivalent of like a 120. So really nice uh, portrait lens as well. So you have this uh, focus limiter toggle switch on the side. And if you don't know what a focus limiter is, um, it allows you to adjust and you have it on like your 300 millimeter zoom or prime, you have it on your uh, 100 to 400 zoom, your 150 to 400 zoom. Uh, and what, what a focus limiter does is it limits where the elements are going to focus. And why would you want to do this? Uh, well, let's look at this one. You have, you know, 0.4 meters to infinity. As an example, you have 0.19 to infinity. What you're doing there is you're utilizing that 0.19 to meters to infinity the one that's highlighted on that picture, you're using the whole range of the lens. So the lens is going to hunt and look for focus in that whole range. Now, if you're only going to focus on something that's, you know, 0.19 meters to 0.4 meters, something that's fairly close to you, if you put it on that, then you're limiting that lens in a small area. So it's going to focus faster because it's going to be looking for subjects just in that area. 
0.4 meters to infinity, same thing. It just depends on, on what you're shooting, how far away it is and where you want to be. Now for me, I leave it in the 0.19 to infinity. It's the whole range. But again, I'm shooting things like car emblems. They're not moving. Nothing's happening. I could take my time. I'm not worried about it. Um, so I'm fine with that. But if you need a faster focus, you can use that limiter to really get that. Now, I think what confuses people on this camera, there's your, uh, your 0.19 or 0.4. There you go. So that's what it looks like on the top of the camera um, when you're working with those. And then you have this one-to-one. -one, and this is what I think confuses people the most. They go, oh, I'm going to do really close up and I'm going to do one-to-one. -one, and they flip the switch and boom, they're at one-to-one. -one, and they go to focus on the subject and it jumps out of one-to-one -one, and everything's out of focus. And I think that that's what confuses people. That top bar there with the, the, the right-hand side, that lower picture, uh, that little orange bar or red bar just jumps out of one-to-one. -one. You got to keep in mind that one-to-one -one is such a finite distance. It's so You're so close to that subject. You could put the camera in manual focus and move the camera in and out at one-to-one, -one, and you'll see how close you have to be to get it in focus. You almost need to put it on a rail at that point to move the camera itself to focus. Now, if you're going to autofocus at one-to-one, -one, you really want to make sure that that, that that subject is right there in front of you. It's that close. So that's where that confuses people, I think. Uh, it's also springy. You know, you flip it to one-to-one -one and it's sort of like a spring and it pops back. Uh, it's supposed to do that. You can hold that spring when you're in autofocus to one-to-one -one and then try to focus. Or again, in manual focus, it won't move and you can use the camera almost to manual focus. So just got to play with it a little bit. Um, can, I, it's, it's, can I jump in here with a question yep, real quick yep, um, right. and remind people that um, if you could please put your questions in the Q&A panel. Uh, they won't get lost in the chat, but um, William's asking is the focus limiter, i.e. 0 0.19 millimeter focal distance or working distance? Oh, that's a great question. It should be, uh, I believe that is actually um, working distance when you're talking about that. So when you're doing like say uh, 0.4 meters or what have you, that's your working distance from the lens, uh, from the end of the lens. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, right, and- thank you. Yeah. And if you guys want a little more info on that focus limiter, uh, Chris McGinnis, uh, our ambassador with, uh, with macro, um, he has a great article on get Olympus on the website under the learn center that deals with just that lens and that focus limiter. So that's some great resources there for that as well. So let's talk about, uh, other lenses. You know, what if you don't have a macro lens? And this is one of the great things about four thirds is that a lot of your lenses you can get super close with. Uh, you can have a 17 millimeter or seven to 14 wide angle, and you can get super close and do close-up photography or macro type photography. So that's a great benefit. And here's some examples of some of the, um, some of the lenses that are great for like close-up photography. Um, and there's some, of course, I'm not adding here, but these are just some of the lenses I want to show. So um, telemacro, you have uh, lenses like the uh, 40 to 150 F4 to 5.6. That's that little we call, I call it the plastic fantastic, right? That's that little $200 lens that you buy for like an EM 10 or what have you, you throw in your bag and it's great for macro. The 14 to 150 is a great lens for macro. So is the 12 to 200. Um, that's another all in one. Uh, the 12 to 100 is, that's just a fantastic lens all the way around the F4 pro um, cannibalizes all my lenses. Uh, but the new one, newer 100 to 400, uh, lens that you might buy for say birding, uh, great lens for macro. Um, so, so think about that while you're out there. Um, also the, on the pro end, you have your 300 millimeter, your 40 to 150. That's a fantastic lens for, uh, uh for macro. And there's both of those. There's the new F4 pro and the F 2.8, the 150 to 400. I mean, you're four foot tele macro with that lens. Uh, and the 12 to 40, uh, both versions, 2.8 uh, Pro 2 and the original, that's a fantastic lens for macro. So not only is it a great, almost like your first pro purchase of a lens, you know, here's my 12 to 40, my standard lens, uh, but you also have a macro lens as well. So, you know, fantastic lenses for, um, for macro. Now you also have things like extension tubes and extension tubes are fun because you can add these to your uh, your lenses and you can stack them together as well. Um, and it's going to, it's going to allow your lenses to get even more magnification. You're pushing that lens out more from the center and getting some more magnification. Now, some of the extension tubes will allow you to work. If you want to play a little bit, they'll allow you to add your, um, tell your, 
your uh, teleconverters, sorry, uh, like an MC14 or an MC22 times. Um, I haven't played with it much, but I can tell you that I have the ProMaster extension tubes. Uh, they work really well as extension tubes, um, but I had a hard time myself fitting those on the teleconverter. So I have a, so you want to play. Um, I have another brand and I can't even remember uh, what brand it is. It could be Kenko or something like that. And that fits the mount on the teleconverter. So just play a little bit. Um, the nice thing about teleconverters is you can have more than one brand or system and you can, you know, pop them on together. So uh, really fun to do and to play with. I've only done it a little bit. So that's another addition for macro. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it here either, but um, ProMaster makes a great uh, focusing rail. Uh, that's, yeah, I don't know, like 120 bucks or something. It's a really good price. And you can put your camera on there and basically your camera becomes, you know, you turn the rail and move the camera in and out. And they have a really nice one I've, I've seen. Uh, the flashes. So you want to get some light sometimes when you're doing macro. If you're shooting like bugs or things like that or products, you might want to get some light in there. One way you can do it is with flashes. I know with uh, with bugs, you want to use diffusers, which we'll talk about. Uh, but the Olympus flash system, we got a few of them. We have an FL600, which is our, our entry level. Uh, we have our FL700. That's my favorite. And we have our FL900, my most powerful pro flash. The reason I like the 700 the most is that and the 900 are weather resistant. You could take them in the rain. Um, a lot of the features like focus stacking, let's say in the camera, everything is figured out for you with this flash. You don't have to worry about setting anything different. Um, you can do them remote off the camera and, um, and the FL 700 becomes a commander as well. So you can use two of those. One could be a commander and it's radio wave. So you could take that around corners, uh, where you don't have to be line of sight, like the 900 or 600. So I really like that 700. It's a good price. Um, nice little flash, fairly powerful. Um, you also have the STF-8. This one gets lost a little bit. A lot of people don't know we have this flash. Now, this is a macro flash system. This came out the same time as the EM-1 Mark II back in 2016. And I think that's why it got lost because the 300 millimeter, the 12 to 100, the EM-1 Mark II, and this flash came out around the same time. And this flash is the world's first weather resistant macro flash. So you can take this out in the rain and you're perfectly fine. It has two little... Um, flashes on it that you can move around the um, uh, the front little um, ah, filter there. And uh, and you can move those back and forth. There's diffusers in there in the box and you can adjust them separately. Um, it's a very, very cool uh, system. And uh, yeah, so that's the, um, that's the STF-8 macro flash. And it's about $499.99. So it's a $500 flash, uh, but it is fantastic. LED lighting is really good. There's a shot from Yannick. Uh, LED lighting works really well because you can buy LED lights either inexpensively or you can spend more money. And it really depends on size. And if you got RGB lights that can change, you know, uh, color intensity for the different Kelvin, you know, to match the colors outside and, and inside and such. Uh, but LEDs are great because you can make them softer, you can make them brighter, you can put, you know, diffusers on them. Um, they're great to have. So uh, LED is another way to get into some lighting. And when you're doing things like this, you really want to light up things like flowers or bugs or really helps to bring that detail out and allow your shutter speed to get up there a little bit as well. Now accessories. So one of the things you might want to do is grab the flash and take it off the camera. Um, you get more interesting images. You have better control of your shadows and highlights. Uh, you can create a better image off that. Um, a lot of people like to put things in the background. I believe here he has, yeah, he has a yellow card behind the wing here um, in this image. I uh, used an LED to light it. There's a, a yellow card behind it, which gives it a nice color. So sometimes people will shoot flowers. They'll put you know, some kind of fabric behind them or what have you outdoors. That way you don't have all these branches and sticks. And there's so many different things you can do with macro, but the light modifiers are great or a flash diffuser because they, they can change the harsh light coming off of these lighting, these um, artificial lighting sources. I want to say uh, they really make it less harsh, right? So the FL 700 flash, as an example, by putting a diffuser on it, like a diffuser you see here, you don't have that harsh light hitting, a, let's say, a bug, right? And, you know, you would think having it on the camera, you're going to need all this light. But really, I've had instances where I've had it in manual, the flash. I've turned it almost all the way down, and I'm still using a diffuser. So diffusers are great to have, uh, and there's a lot of different ones you can get. This one, I believe, is from a company called Rogue. 
but there's a lot of them out there and you can make a lot too. You also have reflectors and reflectors come in a lot of different sizes. Uh, you can make your own reflector. Um, you can, you know, take a piece of cardboard, put some aluminum foil over it or what have you. You can grab poster board. You can use a white t-shirt. You can wear a white t-shirt. Uh, there's a lot of ways to direct that light onto your subject. So the sun's hitting you and you're bouncing it off, right? But I can tell you that um, companies like, I'll throw ProMaster out there again, they have like these five-in-one reflector kits that are beautiful. They're, they're inexpensive, depending on the size you get. You could spend a little, spend a little more. Um, and I have about three kits that are, you know, five in one, like you see here in the picture on the left, where you have a gold, you have a dark to get rid of some light, you have the white and the silver, uh, the clear. And uh, these are great because they're five in one. Uh, you can get small ones like a, I don't know, 16 inch to a 32 inch to an oval. I mean, so many ways to go with reflectors. And, you know, I've, I've actually, <laughs> I've tried to build my own, but it's much easier to just have one. I will admit that I was in Florida a couple of years ago when COVID hit and I had to do some portraits and I didn't have a chance to get to a store. Everything was closed. And so if you guys remember all that, of course. And so I did take uh, one of those reflectors that you use in a car that you block the sun when you're in the car. I used one of those. It was nowhere near a photo reflector, but it did the job for what I needed. <laughs> so a lot of ways to, um, to make things work. Some recommended accessories more uh, would be tripods. Now, Yes, we have the world's most effective in-body stabilizer. And when I'm doing telemacro, most of the time I'm walking around and I'm shooting without a tripod. But if you're doing things like bug photography, you're doing a lot of flower photography, a lot of close-up, you really want a nice sturdy tripod. And the cool thing about tripods and, and even like settings like focus stacking or bracketing in the cameras, uh, it's going to shut the stabilizer off. So you really want a nice, solid, steady tripod. Um, the great thing now is that you have tripods that you can put them almost all the way down to the ground. Uh, you have some that will allow you to actually move the camera like this one over on the right here. Uh, you can actually take the center column and move it to the side where you can you know shoot at different angles. I'm actually using one of those right now um, for a camera that I have in the office. Um, it's a, what is that? A ProMaster like XTC or something like that, but it works really well. And uh, I, I, I tell people, you know, if you don't have a tripod, you at least want to throw one in your car. So you have it with you. Um, I recommend getting a nice one uh, because you're going to have it for a long time. There's carbon fiber, there's aluminum. Again, it's one of those things where if you can go into a store and you can try them out, I never thought tripods would change and they've changed. And there's so many features they have. Um, so definitely you want to try those out, check them out. And um, there's different sizes. I have a large, I have a medium, I have some small ones. Um, again, thought I'd have one and I have like five. So let's go through some tips. I got 15 tips for you guys to get started in macro. And this is sort of the uh, nuts and bolts of the presentation here. Then we'll go into some settings. So this little guy, you'll see a lot of my shots here are with uh, 300 millimeter. Again, the tele macro. Number one is to start in your backyard. You know, the great thing about macro is that subject matter can be found almost anywhere. I mean, you could find metal objects, flowers, colors, patterns. You can shoot the siding on your house and you could find some really cool stuff. It's like going into a whole nother world. So the great thing about macro is when you feel like you're stuck inside or you're stuck at home or you're stuck around the house, walk around and see what's around you. It's really amazing to just shoot close to something, it changes your whole perspective on the world around you. Number two is to work with available light. So I talked about reflectors and things of that nature. Again, take something with you, you know, take some white sheets of paper. I mean, something, uh, throw a white shirt in your, in your bag or wear one, um, but use available light and just have some extra stuff with you. Overcast or cloudy day can actually make for some amazing lighting conditions. Uh, sometimes you have a light peeking through, but it's not harsh. Um, you know, harsh conditions can sometimes give you that really contrasty look. So you try to, you know, avoid it as much as you can, unless that's what you're looking for. Um, but again, try using, uh, try using your body to diffuse the light, or maybe, you know, like I said, poster board, or if you have those reflectors, uh, find subjects in a shaded area on a bright lit day with harsh shadows. Uh, and consider again, early morning or evening hours to get that golden hour glow. That's with anything in photography. You can shoot all day long, but that morning and afternoon light is just beautiful, no matter what. Uh, this caterpillar was actually in a, um, like a closed, it, it's like a museum and they have, um, they have butterflies and stuff. So uh, this was actually an enclosed area where the light comes in through glass windows. So it was already pretty much diffused. 
a really nice light there. This is the stuff I like to do. This is the 7 to 14 uh, 2.8 Pro lens. Uh, and I was really, really close to that, even though it looks farther away. Um, and I probably banged my head coming back out of the trunk, uh, the, the hood. I always do that. Um, but this is the kind of stuff I like to do. And number three is not to be afraid to experiment with different lenses. Uh, you can get close with an eight millimeter macro or a seven and a half millimeter, uh, you know, um, um, Lawa lens or the seven to 14, you know, Olympus, there's a, you can get really close with these lenses. So play a little bit, uh, telephoto zooms, primes, uh, wide angle lenses, they help to create some really cool images uh, and use a wide angle lens um, for impact, right? Something different with your point of view when you're shooting macro, have fun, you know, have fun with this, try to isolate your subject from the background with a long zoom. So when I shoot my caterpillars and things like that you know it really throws that background out that depth of field because i'm compressing it with that long zoom that long focal length like that right there so that's with the 300 millimeter f4 pro i'm about four feet away and you want to select your subject carefully and then focus accordingly so you're in control with what's in and out of focus in the image, right? So when you're close to the subject, your depth of field is extremely limited. Remember to experiment with changing your f-stop to get more in focus. The more you stop down, smaller aperture, larger f number, more of your subject will be in focus. And I don't have any settings on here, but I could tell you I probably shot this at about 5.6. Um, I usually am shooting around f4 to f5.6 on the 300 millimeter. Um, I'm not shooting it at 7.1 or anything like that or 8. Um, usually I'm five, six on this because with four thirds, you're also getting a little bit more with that depth of field, um, with your apertures. And so five, six gives me a really nice depth of field for something like this. Another one, probably, probably at F five, six there again, and you want to frame your subject nice and tight. Uh, with macro move your body around a little bit keep an eye on your background um this this right here was in florida there was a actually a patio behind me that's actually the colors behind this dragonfly are my sister's house it's it's just the the tan sort of florida house color um but by throwing that background out getting really close to the subject and isolating it just gives you that blob of color right that burst of color so again a telephoto lens can help to isolate that subject more uh when you're doing a tele macro and fill the frame as much as you can with a subject that that helps as well. Number six is supplemental lighting. So I talked about using flash or LED or, you know, natural light using reflectors to light your subject, but it really helps to fill in shadows to freeze motion. You're shooting things like flies or bugs or spiders uh, and they're moving. It's nice to brighten up some of the colors and, and really capture that motion uh, by freezing it with a flash. Um, you know, reflectors, like I said, can help to bring light back into the subject and constant LED lighting helps add a touch of lighting to indoor or still life situations. This shot here was um, actually Chris McGinnis, one of our ambassadors who's amazing with macro, uh, did a class with us a few years ago. And this was with the uh, FL 700 flash, the EM1 Mark II and the 60 macro just laying on the ground. This was focus stacked and it was actually handheld. Uh, and it was, I think, about eight images when stacking first came out would only do eight images uh, with the flash and uh, really cool. Just separates it from the background and had a few diffuser on the flash, of course. Number seven is to think outside the box. So when you're choosing a subject, look for geometric patterns, look for cool colors, uh, look for an interesting part of the subject to photograph. Uh, fabrics, textiles, bark, leaves, they can all give you a unique close-up shot. So if anybody can uh, guess what this is, this is my tough camera, uh, the TG6. This is the LG1 light guide. It's a little bit of a LED light you put on there. It gives you a little bit of light and it's in super macro modes. It's like microscopic right here. And I could tell you this is, are you ready? This is my blanket, my old Olympus blanket. And it's a little piece of it with a TG6. So that's actually the fabric, the woven fabric of the blanket. That's how close you can get with that camera. The reason it's out of focus on the corners is because I'm pushing the camera down with the flash onto the blanket. Pretty cool. Keep colors in mind. You know, look for complementary colors, maybe colors that add more contrast and interest. Uh, add your own background. Like I said, a lot of people will use solid colored fabrics or papers. They create a more vivid image. Um, analogous colors for calming and dreamy effect to your macro shots. And those are obviously colors that sit next to each other on the color wheel. You have complementary colors, right? 
Uh, this is actually my neighbor's siding. He has a really, really dark blue house and he has these flowers that come up every year. And so um, I thought the blue and the yellow sort of, you know, really work together well. Always be on the lookout for that stuff. You know, as you get the hang of things, you can kind of pay attention to that a little bit more. When you're first starting out, a lot of times you don't think about colors or things like that because you're trying to focus on the subject. But as you start shooting more, you'll start to focus more on little things like that. So create rain. Uh, this is an old trick that I learned 20 years ago in school, and it still holds true. But you can use glycerin to create rain or a wet look. So this is natural in this picture. Uh, this was actual raindrops, but you can get the same effect by applying droplets of glycerin to flower petals. Use a syringe and, uh, and you can enjoy. Uh, and they'll stay for a long time. A little bit goes a long way. So you don't want to overdo it. Uh, but you can get some vegetable glycerin as an example here and a little eyedropper, drop it on the flowers and really get a cool effect. So, and it doesn't drip right off. It stays there. So if you're not seeing any dew in the morning, go ahead and create your own. Number 10, get yourself a steady tripod. This is the first uh, shot I took with focus stacking um, with the EM1 Mark II at the time in the 60 macro. And, um, it's pretty cool doing that. So I still have a long way to go with it. Uh, but the five axis stabilizer, again, like I mentioned before, it's great. Um, but there's times you're going to need a good solid tripod. Uh, and like I said, focus stacking and bracketing automatically turn the stabilizer off because they're, you know, the thought is you're going to be on a tripod with those. And so stabilizers off tripod comes into, into play. And here's some tips on the tripods. So a small tabletop tripod, that can be great for indoor stuff. So you're stuck inside, you want to do some macro shots, a nice small one you could put on a table or a desk. And focus bracketing and st <laughs> focus stacking and bracketing uh, do require, you know, still and stable support. Again, think about a pistol grip uh, to make really quick changes when you're on your tripod. Um, I like using a ball head myself. Um, sometimes when you need a little help holding still when stabilization is just not enough, a small monopod can be perfect. And that's true too. You got a lot of monopods that have feet now as well. So there's a lot of choices out there to check out when it comes to tripods and monopods. Number 11 is to pay attention to your depth of field. And this is where, you know, focus is really limited in, in macro photography. You have a really shallow depth of field. The closer you get to a subject, you start to throw that background out, right? So a higher f-stop number or a smaller aperture, um, you want to get more of your subject in focus, right? So using a higher f-stop, you might need to increase your ISO, lower your shutter speed, try using a light source, uh, like flash or LED, so you can counter that, keep that ISO down and um, with, with a flash or light, and then, you know, crank that, uh, that shutter speed up a little more so you can get more fast shutter speed to capture a moving subject by using more light. Uh, if you require more depth of field, you always have focus bracketing and focus stacking, which we'll talk about soon. And number 12 is to try shooting insects in the morning. So similar to birds, uh, you know, insects are a little bit uh, slower in the morning. Uh, they love to, they love to fly around fast, but in the morning, they're kind of less motivated, right? It's a little bit colder to temperatures. Um, use a flash to fill in the shadows. Uh, right here, I used the FL 700 to fill in some shadows and brought out some more color, you know, into the, uh, into the beetle here. So it also freezes the motion as well. So try shooting a little bit in the morning when it comes to insects. And of course, they'll be out more too. Number 13 is uh, don't forget some telemacro. So like my favorite thing I said was telemacro. Here's a frog here. And the nice thing is you can get closer to the subject by being further away physically. You know, you're further away, but you're able to really zoom in on something. Um, and again, this is where the five axis image stabilizer really shines because I can hold that 300 millimeter lens and I can still get the shot using that, that, uh, sync stabilization. So you can get some really cool images doing this. And, um, you know, when it comes to things like frogs or again, you know, the little critters like the grasshoppers, it's always fun to shoot them close up. And try some cool uh, Olympus features or OM system features. You know, this is a shot with Pro Capture. Uh, it's a great way to capture images that normally wouldn't be possible. Uh, you know, here's a butterfly landing on a, a flower. I have shots of it taking off as well. 
um, high res mode allows you to capture extreme details, you know, so a lot of color range, less noise, uh, up to an 80 megapixel raw file. So, you know, definitely play with some of these features. Uh, don't just think about focus stacking and bracketing and, and all that stuff. Think about the other computational features you have available to you in the cameras now and utilize them. Play, you know, definitely play. Nice thing about macro is you can play, you know, it's it, photography is great because you could do it in a group or you could do it by yourself and by yourself. You really have a, a chance to just, just play. The more you shoot, the, the more you figure things out. And sometimes you figure out things that nobody else has. Um, know your minimum working distance. And we talked about this a little bit, you know, your, your, your distance from the lens to the subject, uh, get an idea of where that is with your different lenses that you use. So I know with the 300 millimeter that I got to be about four feet away. And as I focus, I know that it's going to light up green where I'm focused. If I'm not getting that green light, I know that I'm not in focus. So I know I have to go back a little bit more. Um, so, you know, make sure you kind of know where you're at, then you can play around a little bit. And, um, and grab that subject. All right, so know that working distance. <clears throat> Excuse me, again, that's from the, um, the lens to the, the subject. All right, guys, so let's get into some of the tips on settings, uh, some more tips, some settings, some features, like, like focus stacking and things of that nature. Let's, let's talk about some of that stuff. So let's talk about focus stacking and bracketing, because this is sort of the, probably one of the biggest things with macro. Um, the fact that you could do this in the camera. Now, these are things that you can do with a camera that doesn't have it built in. But the nice thing about the OM system cameras and the Olympus cameras is that you do have the ability to have these built into the camera uh, where, where they'll do a lot of the work for you. So let's talk about the differences and what they are. And I will tell you that these are features that you really have to play. Uh, there is no definitely set it like this and it's going to do the job. You still have to play with this. and You have to get used to sort of what you're shooting, how far you are away and all that stuff. So what is it? So when shooting macro, the depth of field is limited. Like I was saying, you know, your, your, your working distance is short. Um, you're focusing on a, on a, on a point on a subject and you're not getting a lot in focus. You, you might get an eye on a bug, let's say, and a little bit around the eye and then everything else sort of goes out of focus. But what if you want to get more of that in focus? So you crank up your aperture, even at F22 sometimes though, you're only getting so much depth of field, a few millimeters, and it's not sufficient to cover the entire image sometimes, right? So, so what are you going to do? If you want less blur, you want more of that subject in focus, then maybe throw the rest of the background out of focus. So smaller aperture, now I got to use a higher ISO. Now my image quality is going to suffer a little bit. So you're, you're running into all these issues. There's a shot at 2.8 on top, and there's a shot at F22 on the bottom. Still not getting everything in focus. You know, you, you, the 2.8 is definitely throwing a lot out, and the F22 is uh, grabbing more, but you're still a little bit out. I got to book a little bit because I'm, I'm going long here. I got to talk faster. So what are we looking at here? There's two types of technologies that Olympus has created and incorporated into the OMD and, and now, of course, the OM1 camera. Focus bracketing and focus stacking. So these are tools that enable you to use. It take, they take multiple images at various focusing points in the camera and merge them together, and they create a larger depth of field in the image. Uh, the benefit of the technology is that you can continue to photograph at a wider aperture, like a 2.8 and f4, uh, thus keeping your ISO low and, um, and your shutter speed's not too slow. The best part is that it is really easy to understand, actually. That image right there is 65 images stacked together. So focus bracketing is the more advanced method of creating these images. Um, focus bracketing permits you to take up to 999 images in the camera. And then you use software to merge the images together. Photoshop, Olympus Workspace, Helicon Focus. Those are some of the programs you can look into to do this. Now, focus stacking is simpler, quote unquote, because it's all done in the camera. Uh, depending on which camera you're using, you can select from eight, which would be like your EM5 uh, three, uh, to 15 images, which would be like your EM1s. Um, and not all lenses are able to be used with focus stacking. So you're a little more limited with focus stacking, but it does a great job. Um, now, focus stacking, uh, you know, you, you're basically, um, you're getting a JPEG at the end. The, the final image is trimmed, it's cropped, 
It's got color in it. It's got everything taken care of, your noise reduction, all that stuff. So it spits out a JPEG. And that's because it's a final image. It's all processed. Um, you still get, if you're shooting raw, all of the raw images up to the JPEG. So you can still stack those together yourself after and do what you want to do. But the camera is going to spit out a final JPEG as well. Uh, by selecting focus stacking, you choose the number of images you want up to you know the 15. Uh, you select the focus differential, which is how wide or narrow you want the focus in between each shot. And the camera is going to process that into that single image I talked about. Now, this is what it looks like in the menu. Now, those of you that have an OM1 or are waiting for an OM1, uh, the menu looks a little bit different, and I haven't updated this yet to that. Um, but this is currently what the, what the menu looks like. And it'd be very similar. Um, but you want to go into bracketing. You want to turn the bracketing on and go into focus bracketing. Uh, and then you want to turn on focus stacking. Now, if your camera has focus stacking grayed out, you probably don't have a lens that works. And I'll tell you what lenses those are. And they're also on our website because I know I'm going fast here because I'm running out of time. Uh, the focus stacking menu, again, you want to turn it on. Um, over here on the, on the bottom left, you'll see where you can select the number of shots. So once you turn it on, you can say, okay, I want eight shots or I want 15 shots. Um, and then you can select, I'm getting ahead of myself, but there's a focus differential, which again is the, oh, let me go back because I'll, I'll show you that in the bracketing uh, one, but the focus differential and the charge time um, I'll talk about in the next section. Uh, but basically the focus differential is where you have from uh, zero to 10 or one to 10 and uh, five is in the middle. And that's how narrow or wide you want your shots in between. And again, you got to play with this stuff. And the charge time is if you're using a flash, do you have a flash where let's say you're using a Godox and maybe your batteries are getting low and you might need a second in between each shot. You take eight shots. You want a second in between each shot. It might take eight seconds. Um, if you're using an Olympus flash, it'll automatically set that. You don't have to worry about it. So. And again, you got to play. There's there's no right or wrong way to, to do these settings. It depends on the subject material, and, and you just got to play to see how it comes out. These are the lenses currently that are compatible. So the non-pro lenses are the two macros, 16 to 30. You have your 100 to 400, uh, F5 to 63 because it has that telemacro. And then your pro lenses are pretty much almost all the pro lenses except for the 1.2s and the 1.4 uh, 20 millimeter. So for the most part, it's all of your zooms on the pro end, um, your primes, except for those, those really, really fast uh, primes uh, aren't on there. And again, this gives you an idea of what it looks like where the camera takes in this, in this area here, it took 12 images and it was a 60 millimeter macro at F8 with a focus differential set to three. So you, know, you can see there's some cropping in the camera on the final image on the right. Um, and still, you don't have everything in focus, but it gives you a nice, uh, a nicer focus than you would have had without. And each image, you can't really see it here on these little screens, but each image has something else in focus. It just kind of moves around there. Now, bracketing is a little different. Again, it's a little more advanced because you can set the number up to 999 images. So you're, the more images you get, the more image focus you have and the more you can work with. So it's not just used for macro. I mean, you can use it for landscape, for product, for architectural. You can use it for a lot of different types of photography. And this is what your menu looks like. It's the same menu. You go into focus bracketing, but instead of turning on stacking, you leave it off. You go into the number of shots up to 999. And here we go. So the focus differential, this gets a little bit into that for both. Um, you can see here on the right-hand top, uh, picture where you have the one through 10 and five is right in the middle. So narrow or wide, and you want to select, you know, how wide or narrow do you want those focus points in between? Um, and again, this is something you have to play with. Uh, there's no, there's no like set in stone setting that's going to work for everything. And that's the uh, sort of the beauty of it, right? Sometimes a flash is needed. And again, that charge time. Um, so again, the charge time, if you have an Olympus flash, you don't have to worry about it. But if you're using another branded flash, you want to maybe set the delay. Uh, so you have a little bit of a delay so the flash can recycle in between each shot. And here's an, an example of those differential settings. So here's a, the differential set at one. This is, uh, again, 2.8 with 55 images. So like double the images with a differential set at three. 
And this is the uh, 60 millimeter 2.8, 85 images set at three. So you can see where you really got to play because there is no set right or wrong, but you can see where you're getting a lot more in focus with more images. It's pretty cool. Remember to focus on the nearest and the furthest points of interest in your image. It, it's, it's where the selection of the amount of images to be taken and the focus differential will be important. I'm actually just reading this here, but each image is different. So like I said, you know, try using a wide aperture, try using a narrow aperture, um, you know, try changing it up a little bit to see what works the best for the image. Uh, you can see here where he focused on the nearest point and then he focused on the farthest point. When you stack them all together, that's a final image. And that's basically, that's 75 images at a focus differential of four at F4 at 10th of a second for each image. So you got to play a little bit, but very, very cool stuff that you can get with uh, stacking and bracketing and bracketing, obviously a lot more uh, detail. So let's talk about a couple more things quick. Uh, high resolution mode. This is something that a lot of people don't think about when it comes to macro. But your high res mode, you have a handheld in the uh, EM1, uh, 3, the EM1X, and the OM1, uh, where you get a 50 meg shot. You got 80 meg on a tripod. And something like flowers or, or things of that nature, you take a shot like this, and you can get some really, really great detail um, as long as there's not any movement you know, in that flower or what have you. So some great stuff. Like for me, shooting emblems and stuff, very cool You know, to use high res. Where you find high res is basically um, on the current Olympus cameras, the EM1, uh, let's see, the EM12, EM13, EM1X, even the EM5. Um, not all of them have the handheld, by the way, just the three, the X, and the one. Uh, but you'll find those in the menu. Um, you can go in the super control panel, like this shows right here on the right top. And you can grab uh, grab those in the super control panel and turn them on. Now, the OM one's a little different because you can put it on a function button. It's automatically mapped to the record button on the camera. You press it in, it turns it on. Press it in again, it turns it off. Press it and hold it in and turn a dial, and it changes it from tripod to handheld. Uh, but you can map that to any function button. So that's a great feature on that camera. And this is an example of the uh, high res mode. Now, this isn't a macro shot, obviously, uh, but it does give you an idea of the shot. These were 20th of a second shots. There's 12 of them in the OM1, and it gives you a 50 megapixel image. So uh, this is all handheld. So it just gives you an idea of how fast that works. It takes five seconds to put the image together and gives you a lot of great detail. Again, these are the settings uh, currently in the cameras where you can go in and you can set if you want that 50 meg or 80 meg if you're doing, you know, whether it's tripod or handheld. Some really great stuff on there. Um, if you go into the menus deeper, you can set things like shutter delay. Again, you can set flash settings uh, if you need charge time for the flashes. So this gets a little bit deeper for the high res shot, but you can do that similar to your focus stacking and bracketing. So again, there's that charge time. He's got two seconds here in this example um, where you can recharge that flash in between. So it just sets a little bit of a delay uh, when you're shooting. So a lot of different settings you can do. But regardless, you end up with a nice, beautiful, high resolution image. So let's talk quickly so I can finish this up about the TG6. Now this is a fantastic little camera. It's our waterproof camera. And a lot of people don't realize that it's also a macro gem. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities on the camera. You could do microscopic, you could do focus stacking and bracketing. Now you're a little limited on those, but you have it and you have microscope control. So a lot of really cool features on this camera. And I love it for, uh, for macro snowflakes, all kinds of stuff. So microscope mode permits you to create images from 1.2 times to four times magnification. So the shot of the, um, uh, fabric I showed you, I zoomed into four times magnification, put what's called an LG one light guide on there, the LED light, and it lit it right up and shot it. Um, and this is an example here of, you know, just the uh, wide angle and the four times. You have a little bit of focus stacking and bracketing. So you do have the ability to do eight shots. Um, you can do your waiting time. You can set your number of shots up to three to 10 images on focus stacking. Not too bad. Focus bracketing, you can do 30 images. 
pretty cool. I mean, so, and you do have the ability to do wide, normal, or narrow differential on there. I mean, so you're a little bit limited on the TG6 compared to the other cameras, but you can do it. It's pretty cool. So the camera is really amazing. Um, again, the microscope control mode is fantastic on this camera. Um, it's definitely a fun camera to play with. Um, it's very easy to use. And this is what I want to really show you. This is that LG one light guide. So you can see where putting it up to the watch without a light, super dark of trying to take that shot of the watch face. And when you add that little LG one, it really lights it up. You get nice and close, light up all them shadows. So it's almost like a, a no brainer to buy that light when you buy the camera, it's just about a $35 accessory, but it's fantastic. So. All right, you guys. So that's, that's the presentation. I know I went kind of quick at the end, but it will be recorded. So you can check it out after. Yes. I just want to make sure you guys we have, have a lot info. of questions. Oh, no. Um, okay. I'll do my best. <laughs> you might want to, um, do you want me to read them to you? Do you want to kind of, I can go through. So I'm, I'm um, why don't right you now. start, why don't you start at the bottom? Um, I've, I've put that they'll be answered live. So if you start at the bottom, it might be more relevant to what you were just talking to. So work your okay, way cool. up. Yeah. So, so. Um, is focus bracketing also for time lapse? So no, the thing with uh, focus bracketing is that um, you can't really you can't really com combine the um, a lot of the uh, computational features. Uh, that's the one thing with the cameras you can't do. So like time lapse would be a different you know, totally different thing than, than focus bracketing. And you can't really mix them together. Unfortunately, um, there's a lot of features I'd love to be able to do that with, but, but unfortunately you can't. So um, for focus differentials, a larger number, uh, a greater distance between shots. Uh, the larger number is the more, I got to remember what I just showed. Is it the more narrow? Uh, let me just look quick. Uh, let's see here. Focus differential. Do, do, do. Hold on. Let me just check here. I'm grabbing one of my shots that shows that so I can look at a visual. Uh, so you're more wide than narrow. So the focus differential, um, and I gotta go back to that question, but now I lost it. Oops, sorry, that was me. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> it's it's uh, for the focus differential is the larger number, a greater distance between shots. Uh, yeah, yes, it is because you're wide. Yep. So, um, so as you go to the higher number, you're going to be uh, farther away with each each one, and then narrow is going to bring it closer uh, with each shot. So your lower number brings it closer between each shot. Yep. I'll go back to the bottom. So when using a telephoto for macro, uh, is it more ideal or not? Uh, zoom with the lens and instead move your body closer. It seems like sometimes the quality just isn't as good when you start to zoom. I think it really depends, uh, Jamie, on the on the actual um, one on the lens. Um, and I would play with that because sometimes when you zoom, you're going to really compress that background more too, and get that nice, you know, thrown out depth of field. Um, but yeah, if you're seeing that you're getting a, a more um, a better quality image without doing that, then yeah, you can you can absolutely uh, move closer with your body. I wouldn't say it's better. I would say it's kind of like you know here nor there, you know, kind of thing. Um, why use a 60 macro instead of a telezoom? You could definitely get closer, get a lot more detail, I think, out of it in a sense um, with a 60 macro, just a different type of lens, right? You could do the one-to-one -one, uh, focusing on it. So it's a true macro lens. And so um, there's a lot you can do with that 60 macro that you can't really do with a, with a tele, uh, just a different type of macro uh, lens. Do you turn the Olympus I do you turn the Olympus IS when you use a tripod for non macro? Yes, uh, Chuck. So so the IS and the cameras, the in body stabilizer, has gotten really good over the years. And I know a lot of people say to just leave it on, don't worry about it. But the idea and the reason why manufacturers tell you to turn it off when you're on a tripod, if you're using a feature like focus stacking, it's going to automatically turn it off. But if you're not, like say you're doing a landscape. Um, and you're on a tripod, theoretically, you want to turn it off if you remember. And the, the reason why is because the camera is still looking for movement. So the idea is that with that mechanism moving around looking for movement, it could put your make your image be out of focus. Um, I haven't had many problems with that. I've forgotten a lot of times to turn it off. And I've used a tripod. So I can't say I've had problems with it. But there's the if there, there's the you can, you know what I mean? So if you remember, you know, try to turn it off. Uh, let's see, this focus stacking and bracketing start at the closest focus point, the furthest or in the middle. Great question, Ann, and I always forget because I don't use it a lot. And I believe it starts 
at the, I think it starts forward. I think it starts where you put the focus point. I believe it goes one forward and then goes all the way back or it starts there, comes forward and goes back. I believe I have to actually do it in order to, to remember and look at the images. Um, cause I forget to be honest. Um, but you got to play with it to see it's something I forget every time I do this. Cause I haven't done my macro this year yet. So shame on me for not knowing that right off the bat. Uh, start by focusing on the nearest element of the photo. I would play around, Bob. It's really, again, you got to play with this stuff when it comes to uh, focus stacking and bracketing. Um, I think you really need to sort of like, like Yannick did on that one picture at the end, sort of focus on the furthest point and focus on the farthest point and then have, you know, blend those together. Uh, faster moving objects like a dragonfly. Do I use tracking mode? No, I never use tracking hardly at all. Um, sometimes I use pro capture. Yep. I did use pro capture with the dragonflies uh, at times. The one that I showed here, I did. Cause I remember there was a hoverfly that I captured on one of them. And that was with uh, pro capture. So I mix it up a little bit, but a lot of times I'll use single focus when I was shooting the dragonflies and they were pretty much standing still. They were, they kept landing on this one branch. So I think it really just, kind of matters where the subject is and sort of what they're doing. Uh, but I wasn't using the tracking mode at all. It was either single autofocus or continuous and just uh, focusing on that. Yes, Larry, you can put a lens on backwards with an adapter. That's another, another way to, to do a macro is to use a lens like that. There's a lot of cool ways to, um, you can also have close up filters. You know, there's a lot of cool ways to get macro, but I love the fact that with four thirds, a lot of your lenses, you can just get close with, which is cool. Um, gels should be able to be uh, added to the uh, macro flash. Sure. Because it's a, uh, it's got these two little lights on the end that flash and it has these, um, diffusers you can put on. So I'm sure you can put gels on there as well. I, I wouldn't see why you couldn't put those actually under the diffusers as well. So I'm sure you could do that. Absolutely. Um, I keep going to the bottom, by the way, Heather, <laughs> just to keep going and then I'll keep moving up, uh, firmware updates for the EM1 Mark three and EM1 finished, uh, yeah, I don't, I can't talk about stuff like that. I can't really talk about like yeah, firmware updates very, or very off subject. So yeah, or um, OM1s can... coming in and batteries and all that. I it just really, I, I don't know. And let's, let's stick with the subject yeah. here. So any relative benefit of prime lens versus macro versus zoom, you know, it's just a macro lens is really set for macro, right? So it really depends. I mean, there's a lot of great lenses that aren't quote true macro, like a 12 to 40. Uh, that work really good. Um, you know, the primes are, it, you know, <laughs> that's a great question. Are the primes sharper? It's a great question. I, I have a little story really quick. Um, a few years ago, I was with another manufacturer just before I came to Olympus. And one of the goals was to make one of the newest zooms as sharp as primes or as close as they could get it. And this is probably around 2014 or so. And that's about when I think the manufacturers all started to really go in, in that direction of trying to make their zooms really good. And you started seeing that shift in the mid 2000s there. And they really did. And I came to Olympus, there was the 40 to 150 and the, the 12 to 40. And they're really good. Um, I would say that the zooms are just about at these days as good as primes but primes are still primes still have that edge right um if you're really discerning you can see it but the zooms are really good so it's it's a really great question um i think a really discerning person can see it but primes are still going to be amazing uh you just have less you know all the, the way it's designed it's just it's a it's a prime lens there's not all them elements there moving around uh but the zooms are very very good now uh, let's see. How do you use a long zoom for macro? If you have a tele macro in the zoom, if it'll, if it'll capture it, you can uh, like my 300 millimeter as an example has a great macro capability and you just, just focus on that subject, you know, make sure you use that focus distance, focus on that subject. Uh, 30 millimeter Olympus using it on a Lumix trouble getting things to focus. It could be that I really don't can't answer that. Cause I don't have any more Lumix cameras. I did work at one point with Lumix. Um, I would say it could be, are you using things like their focus stacking capability as an example? Cause the lens may not work with their system, vice versa on my system, a Panasonic, uh, macro won't work with my focus stacking, um, because they're two different systems, the way they work, though the lens works perfectly fine. So if you use it in macro, just macro theoretically in general, it should work. Um, but I can't answer it specifically, but it should work just in general. If you're not using one of their computational features, 
Does the STF-8 flash omit the need for a diffuser such as a, you know, it, it does actually, uh, it does have diffusers that come with it. Uh, but I would say that I find that the STF-8 macro flash is very bright, even, even at low settings. Um, so it may need more diffusion uh, beyond for certain subjects, like say bugs and stuff. It may need more diffusion beyond what's, uh, what's available for it out of the box. So focus bracketing, set the beginning focus point and end focus point. There's no end focus point. You set the beginning focus point, and then it's going to focus through the amount of images that you select. So if you select 50, it's going to focus through 50, but you can't really set the end focus point. Um, but I would say to, you know, you can run it a couple of times, focus on a couple of different areas, and then blend those all together. No, we don't specifically have OM system extension tubes for the 60 millimeter, but you can buy third party tubes like the ProMaster or, um, or others. I don't use extension tubes a lot, um, Rand. I, I have them and I've played with them a little bit. They're more something that I, I grab to play with. Um, so I'd like to try to you know, use them a little more, but I don't really use them a lot. I just have them in my kit. And again, they work with all the lenses. It's pretty cool. I mean, 40 to 150, uh, 12 to 100, uh, you know, the macros. I don't know if they work better with any of the lenses, but they definitely work. So it's something I would say to definitely play with uh, for sure. But Chris is definitely someone to probably uh, ask that to uh, or see if he has anything in his articles on that for sure. Uh, he definitely has the uh, the bug thing down for sure. He's really, really good with the bugs. Uh, yes, Joey, Chris is amazing with the bugs. Love it. All right. Difference between, I know there's a difference between macro and close-up. I'm new to the OM ecosystem. Yep. Nikon, yep. Some great, though. I used to have the 105 Nikon. Uh, 12 to 24. Yeah, the, the 12 to 40. 12 to 40 is awesome. Um you know, you can use, uh, if you want to get a macro lens for the OM-1, I would definitely go 60 macro. It's, it's a fantastic lens and it's, it's under 500 bucks, which is awesome. Um, but the 12 to 40 is a great lens. If you already have that, it, it really is a great macro, but if you want true macro, that, that 60 is awesome. Uh, lenses with IS always marked as such. Yeah. If a lens has an image stabilizer, it's, it's going to, um, it's going to have it on the lens for sure. All right. Any other right. Uh, looks like, questions that I pretty much go through? Yeah, I think if anybody has any questions real quick, um, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Otherwise. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, Jay. So if you have in-body stabilizer and the lens IS, you want to have them on together. They, they will automatically go on together for the most part. So the 12 to 100, the 150 to 400, and the 300 millimeter all have a uh, stabilizer and they work with what's called sync image stabilizer. So those actually work in conjunction with the in-body stabilizer of the lens. And, uh, and they give you amazing stabilization. Now the 100 to 400 is not a pro lens, but it has stabilization on it as well. So it doesn't have the specific sync stabilization, but it has where the body I believe works when you're at like say 100. And then as you start zooming out, it goes to the lens. And so you end up with three stops in the lens. Um, so you want to use a, a faster shutter speed with that, but it works. Um, stack with flash. Yeah. So again, you want to play with the, with your stacking with the flash. Uh, you want to play with the settings and see what works best for you. But I would definitely, if you're using an Olympus flash, uh, you don't have to worry about things like the flash, um, uh, differential, you know, setting the, the flash time, I should say, um, for the recycle of the flash. Um, if you have a, a brand that's not Olympus, you definitely want to want to make sure you give it like a second or something in between shots. Um, so definitely you want to work with those settings and play. Uh, there's no specific like guideline as to what settings work the best when it comes to that. I think it's a lot of uh, a lot of play. You know, it's a lot of trial and error, to be honest, when it comes to the bracketing and stacking. Um, and I think that's whether you're doing it you know, in the camera with the features, or if you have a camera that's not an Olympus and you're doing it manually, um, I think it's just a lot of play. But, uh, but after a while, I think you start to get the hang of certain subjects you're shooting and what works the best for you. So. All right. All right. Um, I think that's just about it then. So thank you, Mike, for absolutely for joining us and bringing us this great class. We're all going to go out there. It's springtime. It's a great time for going out and hitting yeah, gardens. And there we go. 
hitting the gardens and getting some uh, macro shots. So thank you again. And thank yeah, you everybody absolutely. for joining us. I hope you guys are inspired and want to go out there and find some bugs and some flowers. <laughs> bugs are fun, man. I mean, flowers are great, but bugs, they're fun. I never thought they would be, but I never thought I'd get into birds. And yeah. I guess I'm old. I yeah. don't know. I just, I love bugs and birds. So yeah. All right, yeah. everybody. Well, well, thanks. And thanks Heather for allowing us to present. And mm -hmm. I, I appreciate everybody for coming on and, and uh, joining the class. I hope, hope you got some great tips out of it. It will be on the yeah. YouTube channel for Kenmore. And um, so you can definitely, you know, review this again with the recording. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you everybody and have a great rest of your week. And thank you for joining Kenmore yeah. Camera and check us out online, please. That would be awesome. <laughs> So Absolutely. thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. All right. See ya.